Hi guys. So uh, this lecture is going to be on respiratory pharmacotherapy, as you can see here. Um, we're going to talk about different inhalers, the common classes. Um, we'll talk about a little bit of the treatment um, pathways with respect to the asthma guidelines. Um, and I'm going to touch base on COPD a little bit. COPD is probably not something you'll see in your patient population a lot, but it definitely is possible. Um, and, uh, and I just want to go through it, but I'll, I'll spend a lot more time on asthma. Mm -hmm. So first of all, talking about the different inhalers, I'm not going to go to these YouTube videos. You're definitely welcome to check them out on your own, and I'd recommend watching them. I think uh, if you haven't had a lot of experience with inhalers, visually seeing how they work uh, is a lot easier to understand than reading it. Um, as with any kind of demonstration, that probably rings true. But basically, there's th two major types of inhalers, and there's a new one that, that I have a third slide on here. But MDI stands for metered dose inhaler, and really a metered dose inhaler it's kind of what you think of as the standard inhaler. It's a uh, propellant style, so it's something that's in a compressed chamber. And um, one of the biggest differences between using a metered dose inhaler and the other form, which is a dry powdered inhaler, with metered dose, you breathe in slowly. Um, and so it's important that if you're use, counseling somebody on using like a rescue inhaler, like an albuterol inhaler, for example, which is the most common rescue medication out there, um, that you counsel them to take it slowly, which can be difficult to do, especially if you're having, you know, an acute exacer <coughs> excuse me, exacerbation of asthma, but that is the correct method. Um, dry powder inhalers are um, a, a majority of, of uh, well, maybe not the majority, but there's plenty of dry powder inhaler on the market, and the, and the difference here is that you breathe really deep and really fast. The reason is, is because if you breathe slowly, the powder can actually stick to the back of your throat, and then you can end up swallowing it, which isn't going to get any benefit to your lungs, obviously. It's not getting to the right side of action. And um, especially in the cases of some of the steroids, if you're using it consistently incorrectly, you could end up getting some systemic side effects that are under, undesirable from the, the steroid components. So it is important to, to make sure that people are using these. I bet I think that a lot of people who struggle with um, with respiratory disease, uh, and aren't you know if they aren't using their inhalers correctly, they're kind of dead in the water from the get go, right? You have to be able to to do this correctly, otherwise you aren't going to get the drug to the site of action. Especially if you know you're at risk for asthma exacerbations, knowing how to use those medications in acute situations correctly is is critical to preventing people from possibly getting into the ER, or getting into the hospital. The third type of inhaler is called an SMI, and it's a soft mist inhaler. It's essentially kind of the uh, same thing as an MDI. Um, as far as how you use it, it's very similar. Uh, the difference is that they're, the particles are a little um, slower moving. They last longer. Um, and they're formulated with some different propellants that are supposed to be, be slightly better for the environment, apparently. Um, the clinical trials show that basically it's all about the, the size of the particles and how it's getting to the area. So come, so from a, um, a use point of view, there's no real difference in how you're supposed to use it compared to a MDI. And you can go to the, the website I listed here. Um, this is St Stiolto is a new inhaler product. It's a brand name, but they have some, some videos on how to use their products. And they one company makes these Respimat products, and that's what they brand this as. So it's just a little bit of a different, uh, a different delivery mechanism, but it's fairly similar as how you use it to a metered dose inhaler. All right, um, so let's start with the classes of drug. We're going to start with beta agonists. So they're short acting and long acting. Short acting are really for your acute symptoms. Again, this is your albuterol inhaler, your proventil, your pro air. Um, lots of, quite a few different brand names out there, but um, if you've ever worked with anybody with respiratory or any patients in general, you've probably seen these. A lot of people get them. Uh, for a variety of reasons. So they could have respiratory disease, asthma or COPD. All asthma and COPD patients are going to have a rescue inhaler or should have a rescue inhaler. Uh, and then sometimes people might get them prescribed um, for a short course if they're having a cold or some sort of respiratory infection where they're having difficulty breathing to help them get through that process. Um, the, the one thing to think about with short-acting beta agonists, uh, while they are tend to be selective for beta-2 receptors because they're really only getting into the lungs. If you give enough of it, it will cross over enough into the bloodstream where you're going to get some cardiac side effects to remember. Beta receptors, beta-1s on the heart, beta-2s on the lungs. So um, tachycardia is probably the biggest side effect you're going to see with these. And that's okay. Usually it's not 
a substantial amount. Um, if you have somebody who's really puffing on their albuterol inhaler come in, they might be quite tacky. But um, generally speaking, it's something that will go away fairly quickly because albuterol doesn't have a real long half-life. Um, and, uh, and it's ultimately not something that generally will like contribute to an arrhythmia or something, but it is possible. Um, the other product, well, albuterol is by far and away the most common. Leave albuterol is uh, an enantiomer of albuterol, excuse me, that's supposed to be a little bit um, better for the, the tachycardia. So some people will just complain that albuterol makes them feel really jittery. So you might prescribe leave albuterol. The brand name of that I didn't put on here, it's Zopinex. Let's see if I can add that in here. Zopinex. That. Um, and so that it's a more expensive product, which is why we don't generally use it. And the clinical evidence that, well, clinically it's 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 supposed to be as effective as albuterol. However, in in um, looking at safety data, they haven't really seen that. If you look at a large study of people, that you they people report more or less side effects. So some people think it's kind of a a product that doesn't really have all that much benefit. But there definitely are plenty of patients out there that I've encountered who. Um, are very adamant that they want Sopinex as their agent. Um, these are not medications that are taken regularly. If somebody is using their albuterol inhaler six, seven times a day regularly, that's that's indication that they're being poorly managed. You really, um, you should be looking at their short-acting medication use as a marker for how well the controller medications are working. And if they're using a lot of short-acting, probably a good sign that you need to tweak that controlling regimen a little bit. Um, people who use frequently, oh, excuse me, Jan, um, people use frequently are going to be uh, at higher associated for mortality risk and disease severity. So um, the next class is the long acting beta agonists and these really are the same as the short acting but they just last longer. Uh, so theoretically yes you could get the same coverage if you puffed on your albuterol all day but these are nice they last like 12 hours so usually it's a BID dose for most of these products. Um, there's a couple different ones, and we're going to go through some of the combination products because combination therapy is really popular for asthma and COPD, um, and we're mostly looking at combining long-acting beta agonists and some sort of uh, inhaled corticosteroid. Um, so there's some products I listed here. Not going to go through them in a ton of detail. Um, most of them are twice daily dose. Indac Caterol, which I've never seen used to be honest, is a once daily one. Um, most of these again are, are fairly going to be fairly uncommon to see them as monotherapy. Um, you know, in COPD, you could possibly see them as an early um, single therapy agent. You should never see them as monotherapy in asthma. They've shown to increase mortality. Uh, for what reason? I, I'm not sure if we really know. It could possibly be that um, for some reason they might interfere with, with short-acting medications during an exacerbation. I, I'm not exactly sure what if people know what the the rationale for that is, but they seem to have problems with that. So um, this is uh, something you can use in asthma. I want to make that clear that it is an appropriate therapy in asthma. It's just not a monotherapy. So you have to have some sort of inhaled corticosteroid on board as well if you're going to use a long-acting beta agonist for asthmatic patients. So corticosteroids block, um, they work by blocking late phase reaction to allergens and uh, reduce airways hyperresponsiveness are kind of helping decrease that inflammatory process. So where the beta agonists are working directly on beta receptors in the lungs to vasodilate, um, these, uh, these products, or vasoconstrict, excuse me, or to open up the airways, I guess I should say, vaso, yeah, a bronchodilate is the term I was looking for, not vasodilate. Um, so you can ignore what I just said. But bronchodilators are, are going to, that's going to be the effect eventually of agonizing beta receptors in the lungs. Ultimately, the corticosteroid balances that out by helping with some of the underlying disease that's causing it. So while beta agonists are working on receptors, this is more working um, on what's what's the problem? Why are we having some sort of hyper-responsiveness? Is it an allergen? Um, what may, what it, whatever it may be, these work on a different mechanism. So, um, corticosteroids have absolutely no role in acute treatment. So if you ever have a patient on a corticosteroid inhaled product, um, using it as needed is not going to have any effect. Um, the patient may think it will, but it won't. 
Um, and sometimes people think that they're getting an immediate effect because they take a combination product that is a beta agonist with a corticosteroid, and ultimately they get some relief because of that beta agonist. Uh, but they, the inhaled corticosteroid, it takes a couple of weeks usually to see the full benefits. Um, the nice thing about giving inhaled corticosteroids as well is ideally, or well, theoretically, there's very little systemic absorption of the corticosteroid from the lungs. And um, so you really avoid all the nasty long-term side effects that patients get from long-term prolonged corticosteroid use. And um, evidence has shown that that's fairly true. Now, there is some question about is there risk long-term, and um, some people will advocate for supplementing calcium because one of the risks of long-term corticosteroid corticosteroid therapy is osteoporosis. So it could be something, it's a, supplementing calcium is a relatively benign thing to do. So um, if you were concerned about your patient, it, it's not a bad option uh, to think about doing. These are the different products of corticosteroids. So we have a bunch of different names here. Um, I highlighted budesonide for you guys specifically. I was looking into what's used in pregnancy and what's not. And um, corticosteroids, for the most part, inhaled corticosteroids are thought to be relatively safe in pregnancy. Budesonide seems to have the most data associated with it. However, I was also reading that um, one of the problems with budesonide is it might be a slightly less potent corticosteroid. So they recommend that if you, if you have a patient who's not uh, responding well to budesonide, it's probably okay to go to one of the more potent products. But or um, if you have a patient who's really well controlled on some sort of combination product, and budesonide is not part of that, there's probably not any reason necessarily to switch them. Because again, we're talking about local effects, really. You, you aren't getting a lot of systemic absorption with these products, so the risk to a developing fetus is really very minimal. And corticosteroids, while there are some risks in pregnancy, um, in a lot of acute situations, they can be given as sort of a, a, a late-line therapy. So um, there's a, the jury's a bit out on what the risk is with corticosteroid, but it's not definitely not a, a firm um, for sure risk. So ultimately, you're looking at a couple of things, very minimal systemic absorption and, um, and likely not a significant risk to the developing fetus, even if there was systemic absorption. So for the most part, these are pretty safe to do in pregnancy. Um, and they are a mainstay treatment for asthma. So you do want your asthmatic patients to continue these um, during their pregnancy. Um, I didn't really talk about long-acting beta agonists uh, in pregnancy, but there are some. there is some data. It's less um, sound, but um, there is some data to support that, that they are relatively safe as well. Uh, with beta agonists, really, I mean, you're looking at um, effects on the cardiovascular system potentially being your biggest problem. So with the long-acting products, probably okay. An acute exacerbation would definitely be fine because you want to definitely protect uh, the mother. And if they're going through an asthma exacerbation, you want to treat that appropriately. So, um, And that's ultimately going to be beneficial for the developing fetus, right? If the mother is going through an acute exacerbation, you want to make sure she's going to do okay, and therefore her baby is going to do okay. And if, if they get a little bit uh, of an increased heart rate because of the circulating beta agonist, that's something that's again going to wear off relatively quickly. So uh, for the most part, um, these medications are mostly okay to give in pregnancy, especially corticosteroids, inhaled corticosteroids. These are the combination products out there. And again, these are going to be the most popular things you guys see. Um, you guys probably have heard of a lot of these. If you've worked uh, with any groups of patients whatsoever, you've probably heard of these. Um, just because COPD and asthma are such prevalent diseases. Uh, Advair has been by far probably the biggest product um, historically. Uh, it's still very popular. Um, it's fluticasone and salmeterol. Um, it comes as both a discus and a meter dose inhaler, or what they call HFA. HFA, you might see a meter dose inhalers branded as HFA. HFA is, um, I think it's hydrofluoral alkane. I'm not 100% sure on that, but it's the it's the chemical compound of the propellant they use. Uh, and a while ago, some of the inhaled um, or the meter dose inhalers were formulated with these propellants that were shown to be contributing to potential greenhouse gas issues. So they had made everybody reformulate, formulate. So HFA is kind of the new thing. But this discus product is pretty prevalent in a lot of different, um, a lot of different products. Adver being the most common one. The discus component is this uh, branded. Uh, um, delivery mechanism that Glasgow has a patent on. 
Um, Adver has been around for years. Um, generic stuff, generics with inhalers gets a little bit tricky because a lot of times the products tied to the delivery mechanism. So interestingly enough, if you have <clears throat> um, a patent that goes out on fluticasone and salmeterol, for example, um, you can't just make take a company and rip off the discus because they have a patent on that discus itself. So you get into some trouble with the generic equivalents uh, and just not having very many generic options for a lot of these agents. Albuterol inhaler, rescue inhaler being probably the one example of a, a relatively cheap inhaler. Everything else is quite expensive. Um, and, you know, an Advair Discus, the cash price is probably a couple hundred bucks. Uh, most insurances pay for these. So if your patient is well insured, they, they're probably fine. But uh, for people who are paying cash or don't have good coverage, um, that could be a problem. Also, insurances and their formularies may dictate what gets prescribed. So maybe you have had really good success with Simbacort in the past, but um, you're, you know, for whatever reason, the insurance wants you to try Advair first. Well, um, you can fight it out with the insurance companies if you want, or you could just go with the recommendation. Um, ultimately, there's not a lot of data to say that there's any difference between these agents. So it could be patient adherence. It could be, you know, anecdotal um, things you guys have personally seen as practitioners, uh, but for the most part, um, interchanging them is fine. Um, Simbacort uh, it has budesonide in it, so maybe it's a option, better option for pregnancy potentially. Just again, budesonide being one of our preferred uh, corticosteroids. If we go back to our last slide here. Um, systemic corticosteroids, I'm not going to touch on these very often, uh, very, for very long, but um, used in births during an acute exacerbation, they're fairly effective, short periods of time, and um, usually a sustained dose. For the most part, um, I'm not sure what else you guys have learned about corticosteroids because I haven't done any lectures on them, but generally speaking with corticosteroids, I think of 10, <laughs> 10 to 14 days being the uh, upper end of the time period that you can give somebody steroids without having to taper them off. So if you do a 10 day burst, you, you should ideally theoretically be able to just cut them off without any repercussions. Repercussions being over time, if your body's exposed to corticosteroids, you get adrenal gland suppression and your body lacks the ability to, to make endogenous cortisol. And ultimately, um, if you just have somebody on a, a extended course of steroids and you stop them abruptly, um, the body can kind of go into a shock state because they can't produce their own cortisol. It takes a while for that to get back up and also could um, impair their immune system more uh, uh, for a longer period of time than intended. So it is important to think about tapering, but generally with a, with a burst, I mean, you're usually looking at maybe five or seven days. You don't need to taper that. You don't need to think about these really, you know, unless you have a patient who has a history of having long steroid courses and needing tapers. Generally speaking, you know, asthma exacerbation, 40 to 60 milligrams once a day for five to seven days, uh, and you should just be fine stopping that cold turkey after they're done with it. Um, you can give methylprednisolone or solumedrol um, IV. That's our common drug we give in the ER when people come in with asthma, asthma exacerbations. And again, uh, I talked about the sustained use there. Um, anticholinergic medications are not really, from what I could read, not really well defined in their use in pregnancy. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend these. And these, for the most part, uh, historically have been very much COPD focused. So they've, for, the, for the longest time, they've been really just strictly limited to COPD. However, there was some data that's come out in the last few years that shows they're actually pretty effective for asthma. Um, and so they have been added to the asthma guidelines recently, but kind of as a third line option. So um, these are one of the considered a first line option for COPD, though. So COPDers will either start on anticholinergic or a long acting beta agonist as their initial therapy, assuming their disease isn't extremely severe to start with. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time on these because um, if you're working mostly with asthmatic patients, you probably won't see it very much. Um, however, for COPD, it is, they are pretty important to know. Um, Spiriva is by far the most common one. It's been around forever. And now finally we're starting to see some other ones kind of leak out onto the market here. Um, the biggest one was Acladinium or Tudorza, or Tudor, Tudorza, excuse me if I can pronounce that right. A little bit different release mechanism. Um, Spiriva itself, uh, I've got it on the next slide here, is kind of a complicated mechanism. Basically, you see this diagram here. Um, this little hole in the middle, you actually put a capsule in here. And you take that capsule and then you shut this whole system. So this mouthpiece locks into place here. You keep this open, obviously, because you want to access the mouthpiece. 
Um, five here shows you this, it's kind of like a, what do they call it? A piercing button. It's kind of like a little trigger and you push it and it pushes a sharp spike through the capsule, opening the capsule contents. You suck in through here. Again, this is kind of a dry powdered inhaler. So you're breathing deep and fast. Uh, and you do that twice. So you have to do it twice to try and get everything out of it. Um, <clears throat> nebulizers are another option. I have got this little guy sitting on the couch here, and you can see basically the setup of a nebulizer. Um, it's uh, for kids. Masks are usually used because they're, they'll, fid they'll fidget with a mouthpiece. For an adult, it would be more of an oral mouthpiece type situation. There's some YouTube videos there if you guys want to watch them to see how they're done. Um, nebulizers usually are reserved for a couple situations. First of all, children who can't otherwise use an inhaler. Um, second of all, say uh, acute critically ill patients um, who need a lot of drug. Um, you can do like round the clock albuterol and round the clock um, anticholinergic. Uh, I'll just point out um, ipratropium here. Atrovent is the short acting anticholinergic and it's pretty effective for the acute phase. So if you had acute acute asthma exacerbation, you're almost always going to give a product called Duoneb, which is a combination albuterol and um, ipratropium. And uh, that is going to give you a, a dual mechanism to bronchodilate and work very effectively in the acute phase. Um, nebulizers, when you're breathing in a neb, you aren't, you're, you're losing some of the drug, but for the most part, um, if you're doing an albuterol neb, you're getting a lot more drug total than one puff. So one puff of an inhaler about 90 micrograms per actuation and an entire nebulizer of albuterol is about two and a half milligrams so um, a huge difference in the amount of drug there um, so you could really puff on an albuterol inhaler a lot and not quite get to the dose of one single nebulizer treatment um, drugs that affect lipoxygenase uh, LOX is an enzyme that eventually uh, forms leukotrienes in the body, and um, we're going to talk about NSAIDs next week, and uh, NSAIDs work on a similar enzyme called COX, which blocks, or which is cyclooxygenase, and that blocks the um, uh, the formation of prostaglandins and prostacyclins that involved in, that are involved in the inflammatory response, helping with pain management. Um, these drugs do a similar thing, but they're really just blocking leukotrienes. Leukotrienes um, are thought to have some role in asthma, and um, there's a couple different drug targets we do we look at. So there's receptors for leukotrienes that cause this inflammatory response. Sometimes it's triggered by allergens. Other times it could just be somebody is hypersensitive in general or has an overly sensitive leukotriene system. So these drugs called um, Montelukast and Zafirlukast, Singulair, uh, is a very <coughs> common medication. It's a once daily medication that's fairly effective for um, as an adjunct uh, asthma therapy. And these are oral medications, so, you, so they're PO. You don't have to inhale them. Um, Zafirlukast or Accolate is twice daily. Um, there's another medication that inhibits the enzyme specifically as opposed to just working as an antagonist. Um, and it's uh, a twice a day dose drug. So um, Singular is generic now, so it's relatively affordable. The rest of them are kind of expensive. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on xanthine derivatives. These are just here in case you're curious. Um, these are used kind of as last line for a very significant uh, exacerbation. They're, they're more commonly used maybe in pediatric patients, maybe with COPD. I honestly have never seen theophylline used. Um, not to say it doesn't have a place in therapy, but it'd be very unusual. Um, Zolaire is a uh, monoclonal antibody, and what it does is it inhibits IgE binding of mast cells and basophils. Uh, so it's specifically designed to limit the um, um, inf inflammatory response that can lead to an asthmatic, uh, that can lead to asthmatic symptoms due to allergic response. So people who have really bad allergy-induced asthma, this could be a good option. If the asthma is because of something else, um, it's probably not going to be as effective, but for allergy-induced, it can be quite good. It's sub-Q dosed once every four weeks, weight-based dosing. Um, you can have this weird delayed onset of anaphylaxis. Mostly it occurs with 60 minutes. So if you give somebody this, they should be 
Um, they should be monitored for probably an hour, especially with the first or second dose. After that, it's kind of a crapshoot whether you're going to get it or not, but this is the way um, the, the, to be the most safe is to look at it with the first and second dose and then educate the patient. It is expensive, but if you have allergic asthma, um, this can be a highly effective medication that can really eliminate the need for regular inhaler use potentially in some patients. Um, so it's something to think about. Um, the asthma guidelines, I've got the website here. Uh, actually, I don't know if that website's still active. I should probably check that. But if it's not, um, the GINA guidelines, if you Google G-I-N-A, um, which is a global initiative for asthma, that those are the current ones right now. So I think that it's moved around a bit on the web where it is. But um, GINA, if you Google that, you'll find it. Um, so asthma affects about 7% of the U.S. population, so it's a huge amount of people. Um, and almost in any practice environment you work in, you're going to come across that. So you guys working with um, younger female patients, but also doing uh, in doing a lot of primary care type stuff, you're definitely going to come across asthma. Um, death from asthma is extremely rare if a patient gets hospitalized in time, and it's very preventable. So again, rescue inhalers are really key, um, and getting people treatment very quickly is key. Uh, asthma in your airways, nice diagram there. Triggers can be allergens, workplace uh, industrial toxins type, you know, if you work in a, a place that's using a lot of chemicals potentially, um, you know, outdoor allergens, uh, medical conditions. So if you have allergic rhinitis with a lot of post-nasal drip, that can trigger asthma. Uh, GERD over time, um, there's a theory that you might end up aspirating small amounts of food, which can cause kind of a chronic inflammatory process. And medications such as beta blockers that are non-selective can work. We talked about that during the um, blood pressure lecture, but that, that'll work um, by blocking some of those receptors, which can trigger bronchospasm that way. Um, goals of therapy, we want to reduce impairment, uh, so minimize use of rescue medications, um, maintain normal activities is really what we're trying to do here. Um, a patient with asthma should be able to live a very regular life um, as long as they're being managed appropriately and taking their medications correctly. Uh, monitoring, here's a, just a, um, a snapshot of monitoring and what we're looking at here. So looking at symptoms, um, nighttime awakenings, uh, and uh, interference with normal activity. And sort of how things get stratified here. So um, there's intermittent. Um, here's persistent, which is tiered a couple of different ways. So you can see just how where people would fall in with different. So depending on what symptoms they're having, um, uh, where they're going to be classified. Uh, I put these on here just in case you're curious. I put the kids ones on here, but I'm not going to spend any time. Um, this is the uh, treatment for teens and adults, and this is uh, slightly outdated. I just kept this graphic in here because I think it's nice and easy to read. But it shows exactly what I was just talking about. So really with asthma, um, if you have intermittent asthma, which is going to be maybe an early, very early disease or very mild asthma, um, just giving somebody a short-acting beta agonist to have on hand in case they have a problem. Or maybe you have somebody who really only gets, gets one exacerbation a year and it's because of really bad allergy season or something. Um, giving somebody a Saba just to take can keep them, again, out of the hospital and, and, and healthy. Um, if you have any type of persistent, you're going to start with your low-dose inhaled corticosteroid. You're going to move on and add a long-acting beta agonist after that, or increasing the dose of the inhaled... Oh, excuse me, I'm yawning a lot tonight. Um, in increasing the dose of the inhaled corticosteroid. With pregnant patients, now, um, with a normal patient, with a non-pregnant patient, I should say, you, should, you could go either way with that. You could add on the, the LABA, or you could just increase the dose of the inhaled corticosteroid. With a pregnant patient, because we have more data on inhaled corticosteroids, it's recommended to increase that corticosteroid first before you'd add something else on. Um, ultimately, if you keep moving up the chart, you're going to get to high dose corticosteroid, you're going to get your LABA on, and then you're going to be looking at adding different types of medications. So leukotriene receptor antagonists, um, and uh, ultimately you could get to the point where somebody's taking oral corticosteroids regularly, which would be a bad situation, but it is something that could happen. Um, this is the GINA guideline diagram, which says do not alter or reproduce, which I did, so you'll have to forgive me for that. And it's really the same thing. What I would point out is um, in step four here, they say that another option is to add teotropium, um, and step five uh, also has that on it too. So they are actually incorporating the 
um, anticholinergics into the guidelines now for asthma, which is new for this year, um, that there's been enough evidence again coming out saying that they work in asthma and they aren't just for COPD anymore. So you might you might see them on asthma patients, but it's usually going to be people who have pretty severe disease and they're on max dose steroid and beta agonist therapy already. Um, exercise induced asthma, um, it's just bronchoconstriction with exercise, starts six to eight minutes after exercise, resolves in an hour. This usually doesn't require somebody to be on long term controlling medications. However, if you have somebody who's regularly, maybe they're, uh, you know, they do a lot of aerobic exercise, they're a cyclist or a runner, or whatever it may be, um, and they want to continue to do that, but they're having problems with induced getting asthma induction uh, while exercising you could maybe consider controlling medications. But there are a couple strategies to do if you have patients who maybe only get a little bit of, of a exacerbation during, um, during exercise. So um, beta agonists, you can do prophylaxis 10 minutes before exercise. So albuterol, and also for motorol. So if somebody's gonna be exercising a little bit longer, that's a bit longer of an acting product. So you could consider that. But taking a puff of an albuterol inhaler before exercising can be um, something that prevents uh, in induction of an asthma exacerbation. And um, uh, steroids, um, possibly, but again, these aren't acute. So if you had somebody, this would be maybe the patient who's on a really long, uh, who's, who's doing a lot of exercise, and get, this is becoming more of a chronic issue, almost not just a, a once an occasional thing. Uh, the other thing you can do is the leukotriene agents, like Singular, you could give two hours before exercising, you'd get protection from that. So that's another way you could do it, especially for like an asthma-induced exacerbation. Again, if you're running and you have a lot of allergies, um, that could be something that uh, that could be considered. Exacerbation, um, you can look through this here a little bit on your own. I'm just going to buzz through it quick. But really, you're looking at short-acting medications, oxygen, and steroids. IV. So it's it's basically the same style of treatment, but we're just we're 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 ramping it up and giving it in more um, uh, aggressive delivery methods. Magnesium sulfate can also be given um, over 20 minutes, so high dose magnesium, and it can have um, pretty good bronco um, dilation effects. It relaxes smooth muscle, and uh, there's not really a huge side effect for it. So for the more severe exacerbations, you see this used. Um, if the allergic reaction is suspected. Treating it like an anaphylactic reaction is important, so epinephrine, Benadryl, um, famotidine, your typical anaphylaxis treatment. Um, and ultimately, you want to prevent the patient from getting on a mechanical ventilator and getting intubated if you can avoid it. All right, COPD. <clears throat> uh, again, I don't think this is something you're going to see a ton of, and it's, this treatment's not t terribly different from asthma. I'm going to go through it quickly and just point out some of the key, key differences here. Um, it is a very common disease state and it's something that's overwhelmingly linked to cigarette smoking so if you work with if you have patients who are heavy smokers um while we think of copd i think is more of a uh not i wouldn't say elderly disease but an, a, a somebody who's i think of a copd or somebody who's smoked fairly heavily and then it starts to catch up with them in their 40s and 50s uh, and 60s um, but you can definitely get some copd like symptoms early especially if you've been smoking since you were a teenager you could maybe be in your 20s or early 30s and start to get some of that copd already lungs are pretty good at cleaning themselves out and they're pretty resilient and hard to um, destroy uh, completely with cigarette smoking but you do it long enough period of time and you can definitely accomplish that uh, this just shows um, some respiratory measurements with uh, reflect, uh, reflected with with uh, with respect to age. You can see that respiratory um, function kind of peaks in the 20s and 30s, and then it just declines naturally. Um, you can see that so the red curve is your normal. The blue curve is uh, reduced lung growth. Uh, so this would be maybe a person who has some sort of congenital abnormality where their lung function is is a baseline lower. Um, the green function shows premature decline in in uh, in, uh, in lung function, and the orange would de depict accelerated decline in lung function. So this could be a number of things. Um, what what you would think about here is maybe this being like the smoker, um, just being on a different chain here. Um, the interesting thing is is if you stop, like if you're smoking and you're on C's pathway, 
if you stop smoking, you can normalize and kind of get more on a, a steady curve like A. So it, the lungs, again, are pretty resilient and can um, recover, not completely. And sometimes you do so much damage to them that you can't recover at all. But if you do stop smoking, you do get some benefit almost immediately. Uh, this just shows an interesting Zen diagram about how everything's kind of connected as far as respiratory diseases. Um, so COPD, common um, symptoms are dyspnea, cough, and sputum production, and that's really how, how we're addressing it and how we're diagnosing it. Um, wheezing and chest tightness is a little bit less common and more common with severity, um, usually associated with a sedentary lifestyle. Um, a lot of patients might be un unaware of how significant their COPD is affecting them because they don't really get up and move around a lot. And the rare times that they do, they find themselves really winded. Um, so adjusting their lifestyle unknowingly may all of a sudden lead to, I uh, can't breathe very well, and then they need to, to make a change. And then they come into the doctor and realize that they have terrible lung function. Um, respiratory symptoms. Uh, usually initially only on exertion, but eventually as the disease progresses, you'll have chronic respiratory symptoms, so difficulty breathing even at rest. Um, diagnosis can be difficult. You can maybe, uh, with COPD exacerbation, there's always a question of, is it um, community-acquired pneumonia? Is it congestive heart failure? So depending on your patient's history, those are things to think about. And you can, of course, diagnose that with imaging and, and symptom um, and addressing what types of symptoms the patient has too, but uh, just something to think about. So our goal, um, preserve respiratory function via pharmacologic therapy and focus on non-pharm therapy too. So smoking cessation obviously being a huge one, um, reducing other risk factors if possible. So if there's like environmental exposure or something like that. Vaccinations have been shown to have positive mortality benefits with um, COPD patients. So getting your flu vaccine every year, and um, also the pneumococcal vaccine if you meet the age requirements for it. Uh, these are the gold guidelines, which is the COPD guidelines. If you want to read more about these, you can Google gold guidelines and you'll find them. Um, I like this diagram. It's pretty straightforward. It shows kind of um, COPD stratified into a couple different areas there and what the um, pulmonary functions look like. Uh, and then it shows how to treat people. So really, the, the COPD is treated very similar to asthma. There's one huge difference, and that's you start with your bronchodilator and add the inhaled corticosteroids. Remember, with asthma, we start with corticosteroids and we add our beta agonists. Well, with this case, you would start with either a beta agonist or an anticholinergic medication, which are uh, what's listed here with the long-acting bronchodilators. You also want to have your short-acting on board, too. So you want the person to have something for rescue. And then you add your long acting, and then you add, excuse me, your um, glucocorticoids. So just flip flop the the treatment strategy um, for first and second line, and, and that's COPD versus asthma in a nutshell. Ah, uh, this just goes over some other things to um, eventually get to the point um, where, depending, so you can see these patient groups here. Um, if you have poor pulmonary function and a lot of exacerbation history, you get into these higher groups here. And ultimately, the more stratified you get towards severity of disease, the more aggressive the treatment we get. So eventually, we get to category D, which shows triple therapy here, which is your corticosteroid, long-acting beta, and your anticholinergic. Uh, so um, it does actually end up being basically the same treatment as severe asthma, uncontrolled asthma. You're using all the same medications. Again, it's just these initial things that are different here. And that's basically what I've just talked about. So this will break it down. Uh, I don't think there's anything here that I haven't said already. Um, just some other things. Is there any bronchodilator that's better than the other? Um, so for example, are anticholinergic medications better than long-acting beta agonists? And there was a large trial that came out that showed teotropium, which is Spiriva, is more effective than salmeterol um, in 2011. And uh, there's another trial, however, that showed indac indicatorol, which is a, a rarely used long-acting beta agonist that was as effective as teotropium. So uh, there's mixed evidence on which is better. It's likely that they're fairly similar uh, as far as their effects. I think Spiriva tends to be a really popular option because it's a once-daily in inhalation, so it's a little bit more convenient that way. Uh, why is glucocorticoid used secondary to bronchodilators and COPDers? Well, um, it's been shown to decrease exacerbations and slow progression of respiratory symptoms, which is good, but fairly little impact on lung function overall or mortality. 
when you measure for for measuring FEV1 uh, or your other pulmonary function tests, um, and really generally not going to be used as monotherapy in COPD. So in asthma, we don't use long-acting betas as monotherapy. In COPD, we don't use inhaled corticosteroids as monotherapy. Uh, what about combination with the long-acting beta? Uh, great idea. Works works perfectly fine. Um, triple therapy using everything. There's a big study on this called Uplift in New England in uh, 2008, and they randomized people to triple therapy or um, beta agonist plus um, uh, plus uh, a muscarinic agon a agonist uh, or antagonist, excuse me, an anticholinergic, and um, they showed um, significant improved airflow and reduced exacerbations in quality of life. So they show that triple therapy had some benefits over just this, the two therapies. Well, it'd be interesting to see if they did a trial with the long-acting beta agonist plus inhaled corticosteroid um, and then the other one. So if there's another arm here, it might be a little bit more um, interesting results, I think. And some stuff on refractory COPD, which I'm not going to go into. It's here for your reference if you're curious. Exacerbations are very similar. Um, the difference being is that you can have uh, an infectious component. Most often it's viral, so really treating COPD exacerbations with antibiotics can be a bit controversial. Um, for the most part, standard medications are fine. Um, you usually don't have to treat these as, a, as aggressively as you would treat a... Um, as you would treat a uh, community acquired pneumonia. It's kind of think of it like as a mini community acquired pneumonia. Um, doxycycline, let me correct my typo here. Uh, doxycycline is probably by far and away the most common. It's got good atypical coverage, good strep pneumo coverage, covers some other things as well. Um, there's a couple other options there too. Um, that's all I got for you guys. Thanks for listening. Let me know if you have any questions as usual.